So we are so delighted that Kaishan Kong is here today. She is a longtime friend of Carla and a graduate of the um, PhD program in second language education here at the University of Minnesota. She's currently associate professor of Chinese at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And today her talk is titled Crossing the River by Feeling the Stones, Chinese Teachers Perspectives and Integration of Social Justice and Teaching. So welcome Kaishan. Thank you very much, Kate, for your kind introduction. And I want to thank Carla for uh, giving me the chance to present my recent research work with you all. Um, I've attended Carla lunch presentation many times, but this is the first time that I present through this channel and I feel excited, appreciative, and a little bit nervous. So I hope I'll do an okay job. Um, so my title today is Crossing the River by Filling the Stones. This is a very well-known Chinese folk saying that we see a lot in China to describe the process of people exploring a new territory. This saying emphasizes, the, emphasizes a steady attitude and taking one step at a time when you navigate through uncertainty. And I've seen this slogan a lot in China to describe our educational reforms, economical reforms, and societal reforms. I use this topic for my presentation because this was a shared sentiment by my participants in this study to describe the process of understanding and practicing teaching for social justice. So in this presentation, I want to share with you briefly the research background, research design, but I want to spend more time reporting, sharing with you the findings in this session, and it will end with implications. And of course, I welcome your comment and feedback at the end. What made me decide to do this research? As we know that social justice is not a new topic in American education. It has been discussed for decades. Within the last decade, social justice was really receiving more attention and, and interest in the, in the landscape of world language education. That being said, there's still a big lack of knowledge and publications in this line of research. When I was doing the literature review, I found publications on social justice within China as a context. I've seen publications on about EFL teachers agency in teaching for social justice in China and in other countries. But I really found very little publication scholarship about social justice in Chinese as a world language teaching within the US and other countries. And I think it's very important for us to fill in this gap by sharing what we know. Also, the volatility caused by political climate and social movements over the past few years was really a wake up call for many world language teachers like myself to really be candid, to reflect on our feelings, share our feelings and discover what people think and what teachers do. And especially the Black Lives Matter movement after the killing of George Floyd and the anti-Asian violence during the pandemic time. Like many world language teachers, Myself, as a Chinese immigrant to the US Asian American world language teacher, I had very complicated feelings, fear, hurt, anger, vulnerability, and I felt the urgency to really uh, do my part, do more to discover what we can do, what we can educate the next generation and how comfortable people are doing in this field. So to some degree, this work is more than scholarly work for myself, it's personal work for myself. So I started doing literature review. I review literature on social justice manifestation in classrooms. I read papers on how teachers embedded social justice in language education. Again, not much could be found on world language education, but teaching literacy, teaching uh, critical thinking skills in language and culture. I read papers in that line. I also read papers about teachers' positionality in justice orientation work. And also I read papers on teachers agency. I wanted to discover how, in what way, and if teachers enacted the agentic power to teach for social justice, what supports and challenges they encounter. During my literature review time, two papers in particular greatly inspired and informed my own study. 
The first paper was Pina Pinchera and the Costas paper. In this paper, they examined an ESL teacher in Chile and used an economic they created an ecological model to examine the complicated combination of internal and external factors that influence this particular teacher's enactment of social justice teaching. The internal factors included teacher purpose, competence, autonomy, reflexivity. External factors included a micro, meso, and macro level factors. And this study was built on prior social studies education model by Pantic, and also took a lot of um, ideas from the Douglas Fir Group's trans transdisciplinary framework to look at SLA. So they created their own ecological model to look at that. The other paper that really helped me a lot was from Wesso, Wesley and Glink's paper, where the, the authors looked at 12 K to 16 world language teachers uh, enactment of teacher agency to teach for social justice. The authors adopted a dialectical lens to look at the interplay between teacher agency and structures. And the structures refer to internal, external dimensions that influence the supported and impediment, impediment and support the teacher's agency. The authors categorized three dimensions, the professional community, students' perspectives and contributions, and curriculum and curricula. So these two papers in particular laid essential groundwork for me to build my own, form my own theoretical framework. And for my theoretical framework, I consider social justice, teaching for social justice as an ongoing process and it's influenced by multiple dimensions. And I asked two research questions. The first one was, how do these Chinese language teachers understand social justice and understand integrating social justice in their teaching? And the second one was, how do these Chinese language teachers, what do these Chinese language teachers do to integrate social justice in their teaching? As you can see the two underlined words, the first question was really investigating their understanding, their views, uh, or to some degree their positionality. And the second one was inviting these teachers to share their practices with me. So this is an ongoing study. Um, so far, I have collected data from 22 world language teachers representing seven languages. But due to my own positionality, my identity and professional network, more than half of the participants are world Chinese, Chinese as a world language teachers. And 12 of them, taught Chinese when I collected data. And among the 12 teachers, two were Caucasian white teachers who were teaching Chinese in the US and 10 were immigrant teachers like myself. In this study, I particularly wanted to share the data from the 10 immigrant Chinese language teachers like myself, because I feel that they could share with me nuances of their multiple identities and feelings. So in this particular presentation, I didn't include data from the two white American teachers who teach Chinese as a world language. This table gives you a brief profile of the 10 participants. They came from mainland China and Taiwan, K to 16. The years of teaching Chinese range from five to 25 years. And I wanted to point out that the years of teaching Chinese refer to the teaching experiences within the US because some teachers taught ESL, EFL elsewhere before moving to the US. So I was looking at the years of teaching Chinese within the US context. When I collected data, I had a one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interview with each participant. They lasted one to one and a half hours. Due to the pandemic, all interviews were conducted on Zoom. And during the interview and after the interview, I invited the participants to share with me any materials they were willing to share to help me better understand their positions, their attitudes, their understandings, and their practices. So I'm very grateful my participants have shared with me lesson plans, templates, activity design, PowerPoint slides, and audio, video, or text information that they used in class teaching. So the middle picture you see here is an activity designed by one of the participants. 
Also, I received my participants' personal posts on social media. I'm very interested in that because the social media posts, I think, truly reflect their personal views. And these personal views on social justice or related to social justice may be consistent or inconsistent with their actual practice or pedagogical decisions in the classroom. So I'm very grateful that my participants were very generous to share their materials with me. And now I want to move on to findings and discussion and share with you, report to you what I have found. And I want to remind you my first research question was, how do these Chinese language teachers understand social justice and understand integrating social justice in their teaching? This question really has two parts. The first part is understanding social justice as an overall concept. And the second part is understanding integrating social justice in teaching how important, whether it is important. For the first part, understanding social justice, all participants share very similar understanding. They refer to social justice as an ideology or concept where all human beings have equal access to resources, equal sharing of social power and benefits. When the social justice concept is placed in the education setting, they believe that the resources refer to students' equal access to learning opportunities, personal needs, and respect. And their responses really aligned with Nieto's notion that consider social justice as both a philosophy and an approach to treat people with fairness, respect, dignity, and generosity. When asked if they think and how they understand the importance of integrating social justice in teaching, all of the 10 participants share with me that social justice is very important in language teaching. A couple of participants mentioned that social studies as a subject may be a better natural fit to engage social justice topics because of the content of social studies as a subject. But majority of the participants share that language teaching is not just teaching language per se. It's not a metalinguistic, more than metalinguistic knowledge. Language teaching is intertwined closely with culture. And social injustice is often a result of xenophobia and ethnocentrism and hatred and discrimination against other cultures. Because of that, our, our language classroom is actually a very important and natural space for students to discuss social justice topics. And they also share with me that the importance of uh, integrating social justice in world language classroom is reflected in two ways. One is integrating social justice in content centering social justice topics as the content. The other one was creating a social justice oriented classroom culture. Their responses are what Randolph and Johnson would call as curricular elements and instructional choices. And that led to my second research question, what do they do? What do these Chinese language teachers do to integrate social justice in their teaching? And their responses also can be classified into two categories. One was to embed social justice in curriculum and instruction. The other was to create a social justice oriented class culture. That means sharing the practices, the practices that they share with me really echo and closely align consistent with the understanding of integrating social justice that I just shared with you a moment ago. And next, I want to share with you the specific examples in these two categories. The first one was embedding social justice in curriculum and instruction. And I uncovered three sub-themes under this umbrella. The first one was thoughtful and systematic integration of social justice in curriculum design. And I have collected incredible practices and examples from my participants. For example, one of the teachers, one of the participants intentionally and thoughtfully embedded Black Lives Matter topics in her Chinese language class, in lower proficiency Chinese language class. That was a very courageous and thoughtful move. So if you remember the slide I showed you minutes ago about the Black Lives Matter activity design in my data collection, that was the activity designed by this teacher. The activity was to help students understand the vocabulary. So you see on the left column was a list of Chinese words and phrases with 
Chinese phonetic transcript, pinyin as scaffolding. The right column was English vocabulary. Having students utilize the Chinese, although limited, Chinese knowledge to make connection, match the Chinese words and English words. Building on that, the teacher made several simple statements, but centering around Black Lives Matter topic, simple statements have students write true or false and explain to stimulate a profound discussion. I find this teacher doing a great job because the teacher increases the content difficulty because it's a very difficult topic, critical topic, while the teacher lowers the language difficulty. And that strikes a good balance for students to not having both difficult content and both difficult language uh, level. Also for the same teacher in her higher level Chinese language class, uh, it was content-based. Uh, talking about education, China's societal development, this teacher intentionally brought in social injustice topics to the classroom for students to discuss, including unequal access to education, uh, low-income family. So this teacher, I can tell, really systematically planned her curriculum from low proficiency to high proficiency class. Students can do different things, but centering around social justice topics. Other teachers share similar activities by bringing in anti-Asian violence topic into the classroom and lowering the language requirement. I mean, less demanding in language production, but more demanding in content understanding. Another teacher shared with me multiple great examples that she did. So when she was talking about identity, we know that who are you? How old are you? Um, um, what hobbies do you have? So all these topics are very commonly seen entry-level topics. This teacher had quite a few Asian American students in her class. So she asked the students, what Asian Americans do you know? Who do you know? When she found out that many students refer to Jeremy Lin, the Taiwanese Asian American basketball player, the teacher intentionally created activities to engage the students to get to know ordinary Asian American people in their neighborhood who do extraordinary things. And these extraordinary things go beyond the, include more than the glamorous celebrities' career, but also could include these extraordinary things can include this Asian American working hard to get a degree or working hard to run the business, working hard to support the family. This way, students really have a chance to connect with community people. And some students got a chance to connect with their distant relatives and feel proud of their Asian American identity. The same teacher also worked very well with other colleagues in different subjects to embed UNESCO sustainable development goals in her teaching. She shared with me that at the beginning of the semester, she will make a list of all the topics she needs to cover in the Chinese language class. Also the 17th SDG in UNESCO, the sustainable goals. And she will do a mapping on herself thinking uh, what topic was sustainable goals could be embedded in what topic. So this is a reflection of systematic integration of curriculum design. And she shared with me one example when she taught students about housing, like how many rooms do you have in your family? What, so, what furniture do you have in your family? That is very pure language instruction. But she engaged the students to work with different teachers to find out, to do research about housing inequity all around the world, to look at housing, housing and environmental protection all around the world. So students know beyond their own community, their own family. And the project was asking students to design a housing plan for a multicultural family in the end, an imagined multicultural family. Through this project, students got to practice multiple skills, budgeting, you need to talk about calculation, how much money do you have for this family? Environmental protection, where is this family located right now? And addressing to people's needs, since it's a multicultural family with different identity, what personal needs do they have? So the diversity mindset was also enhanced. The same teacher stressed to me the importance of learning from other colleagues and working from other colleagues. The housing project was working with other colleagues and she also shared with me learning from other colleagues. Last year, if you know Japanese teachers or you may have heard of other teachers, 
Engaging Students in an Onigiri Action 2021. Onigiri refers to the Japanese rice balls, but normally they are in the shape of triangle made with rice. So in 2021, Onigiri Action was a worldwide campaign to fight against hunger. And many Japanese、uh, teachers in the U.S. actually engaged their students in this project. They taught students step by step. They taught students how to purchase materials to make the onigiri.、Um, actually, making the onigiri, taking a picture, sharing on social media, using Japanese as a target language to talk about the importance of fighting against hunger. And once students、uh, share this. Practices. The sponsors, the campaign sponsors, would sponsor money to regions where hunger exists to fight against hunger. So, this participant in my study, she observed that her Japanese counterpart doing this action campaign, she saw the importance of advocacy and she action. She engaged her Chinese students in the Chinese program to do the same. So, although they use Chinese, not Japanese, it was a great way to increase students' awareness. Last but not least, another teacher shared with me that she designed role play projects to address social justice issues. She engaged students to create a list of social justice. Topics they are interested in. This is very important because if these topics students are interested, personally interested in these topics, they are more willing to invest time and efforts to do a good job. So after students make a list of social justice topics that interest them, they take on different roles on one topic, do research, and present what the role would say about this topic. For instance, if one of the topics was campus internationalization, then students would take on a role as imagine they are international student. They interview international student, then they took on a role as international student to address the lack of support or the good areas or improvements needed to address this topic. Another student may interview administrators on campus and then took on took on the role as a principal. Or the president of the campus to address campus internationalization. This activity engages students to brainstorm ideas, to do research, and then to express their view in the target language. I find this ex- example is really inspiring and incredible. So I applaud my participants for sharing that. Also, many participants share with me that they will involve students in critical discussion on topics on the spur of the moment. They will say they may not embed social justice topics in the whole semester, but when breaking news occurs, they would spend the first five to ten minutes in the next day's class to address the elephant in the room if such a big news. And as we all know, over the past five to six years, there were many moments like that in the U.S. So they had a lot of critical discussion on breaking news and special moments. And all participants also share with me the importance of expanding selection of teaching materials. They all talked about the importance of choosing authentic materials and materials that can represent diverse voices within one culture. We can say Chinese culture is actually a very broad umbrella. Not everyone in China practices the same way or thinks the same way. So these teachers has stronger awareness to bring in different voices. So these sub themes were discovered from this big umbrella embedding social justice in curriculum and instruction. The next theme category in my finding was creating a social justice oriented class culture, and teachers share with me many types of practices, including calling student by the name and the pronoun they preferred, creating ground rules with the students so they can have a sense of community, using inclusive language in the syllabus and emails, avoiding gender binary based language such as boys and girls. Inviting students to share their home culture. Remember, without singling out anyone or making stereotypical comments. I see that many teachers want to engage students from a minority culture or or somewhere else to share their home culture, but we want to do it with more care so students will not feel they are objectified or tokenized. Also, many teachers talk about the importance of making accommodations to students' needs. They use the pandemic as an example to share with me that during pandemic, a lot of teaching was transferred to online platform, 
And that was the time when income differences and unequal access to internet played a part. They didn't want any students to feel that they were left out or to feel bad about their lower income family status. So the teachers made hard copies of the materials for whoever that needs to take it. In this way, students don't feel they are singled out, but they all have the equal access to learning. All my participants share with me the importance of teachers as role models. They feel that students are not just learning from your lecture, they're learning from your behavior. You are a mirror that students see and students behave like you. As one of the participants, Annie, mentions in her interview with me, we are all in this together. We are all human beings. In this, Annie wanted to share with me the importance of showing your empathy with students when discrimination, when violent happenings occur in the society. It's important for teachers to stand in the same shoes with students, in the same boat with students, show our empathy, solidarity, and it's okay to show our vulnerability. I believe that many world language teachers, some, I believe some world language teachers have shared their vulnerability and hurtful feelings during anti-Asian hate, including myself. I took some moments to share with my students. I got emotional, but there was a very precious moment to bond with students. And I believe that, and I heard from my participants that when students see that the teacher they know very well on a daily basis feel hurt, they know the feelings are true. They may be more aware and more caring about people around them or strangers. So this, this awareness is cultivated. Also among my participants, some were uh, teachers teaching elementary school kids. They shared with me that although it was challenging for them to talk about social justice topics because of students' age, immaturity, and language proficiency, I applauded them for trying innovative activities to plant the seed to cultivate awareness in young learners. They shared with me two activities in particular. One was band aid activity. You may be familiar with that. My participants didn't create this activity. They learned that from elsewhere, internet, other colleagues. So for this activity, when a student gets injured in class, cut the finger or something, the teacher would give the student a band aid. And then the teacher gives a band-aid to each student in the class, even though they were not hurt. And students may say, I don't need it. Why do you give me a band-aid? I'm fine. I didn't get hurt. And teacher will use this as a teachable moment to tell students that you see, everyone needs help to a different extent. You may not need the band-aid at this time. That person needs. So I probably do not need to give you a band-aid because you don't need that. When you need different type of help, I will offer to you. So this was a good activity for my, from my participants to teach the difference between equality and equity. And the second activity was put yourself in other shoes. This activity was played more before pandemic when students could have more intimate interaction in class. As the name suggests, the teacher ask students to try everyone's shoes. I don't think they do that now. To try everyone's shoes and they notice that my foot doesn't fit in everyone's shoes. And that is a simple activity to help students understand we are the same age, we're in the classroom, we can be good friends, but we are different in some way. And that was a good way for them to talk about what diversity, what inclusivity means to the students. So um, I think these teachers are working very hard to find ways, innovative ways to cultivate awareness in their young learners. So I also asked my participants what support they received and what challenges they faced when they try to understand and integrate social justice in teaching. Their responses could be summarized in this picture. While my participants felt that they had institutional support, they knew the school expected, the school endorses the equity and inclusivity and diversity. At the same time, they still found themselves in an ambiguous position. And this ambiguity was also, uh, was the school was also facing this ambiguity because the school itself had to navigate the divides among student families. So, and also the political divide in the society really made my participants feel they are not in the best position. They do not have the best knowledge to teach that. 
Also, while my participants felt they had different degrees of autonomy to invest social justice, they do not always feel confident and competent and comfortable to do so because of their individual limitations in knowledge and understanding. Especially, they pointed out the knowledge limit, limitation of knowledge in social justice issues within the U.S. context. Not growing up here, not receiving education here, they feel that they do not know the most. So that kind of prohibits the their willingness or courage to teach for social justice. Also, while they feel that there are professional training opportunities in the field, many of these professional trainings offer general strategies, how to address, how to cope with heated discussion, how to, uh, how to manage, create a classroom for students to voice their opinions, while they still find inefficient and less targeted professional training. In particular, they wish for language-specific Proficiency targeted age appropriate templates and examples to do so. So, so far I share with you the findings. What do these findings mean in my discussion? I wanted to remind you of my theoretical framework. Part of my theoretical framework considers teaching social justice, teachers agency to teach for social justice being influenced by multiple dimensions. And in my study, I discovered three salient dimensions, culture, curriculum, and community. These three dimensions have been discussed in prior work scholarship. They may have been called slightly different terms, but they all refer to the same direction, factors, dimensions, structures, things that influence teachers' enactment of their agency. So for community, in my study, community refers to the participants' schools, colleagues, students' engagement, and the society as a larger context. While the participants felt emotionally supported by the school and the colleagues, they felt that they were still placed in a practical ambiguity. So on one hand, some schools already established EDI committee or EDI offices. They, they felt that these EDI committees and offices didn't really give them tools, filling the toolbox, how to teach, what to teach. Rather, these committees and offices encourage teachers to come in and share your frustration and share incidents if you feel discriminated. So it it's became more of an emotional support. Some participants share that during the anti-Asian hate movement, they received many supportive uh, messages from their colleagues. And some felt that their colleagues were like-minded people who wanted to teach for social justice. However, they observed other colleagues being reprimanded or receiving consequences of actually doing so. So they received complaint letters from parents, the teachers received consequences and warning from the school by doing so. So while they feel they were supported, they didn't feel they were supported. They were still in this very uncertain situation. As a result, the teachers wanted to play it safe. They wanted to avoid, be very ginger, avoid this divided and contested views on social justice. They wanted to be very sensitive and caring to everyone. They wanted to avoid errors and avoid certain topics altogether. And they mentioned, in particular, many teachers mentioned political correctness and the cancel culture in the U.S. They say that although the U.S. promotes freedom of speech, sometimes depending on the listener's political views, sometimes your expression could be misinterpreted or could be used against you. They don't want to be canceled in this culture. And not growing up here, not learning about political views in past years, Sometimes they are walking a fine line to share their views and be political correct. So this concept is still quite, quite uh, uncertain and vague to my participants. And participants said that they do not want the white students to feel that they target them. So in general, they just want to play on the safe side and keep their job security. They do not want to jeopardize their job. The second dimension is curriculum. In my study, curriculum refers to the lack of time, space, autonomy, knowledge in curriculum and design teaching experience. And as I shared with you the data earlier, 
I've seen evidence shows that my participants were using agentic power to utilize what's available to teach for social justice. I share with you those activities my participants have shared with me. They enable students' agency to inquire about Asian American culture. They emphasize advocacy. They adapt to various language proficiency levels. They were all great, wonderful examples. However, I noticed that those examples were shared with me by, by my participants who are either very experienced in teaching or who were professionally trained in curriculum and instruction or both. However, not everyone has the privilege to receive profound training in curriculum and instruction, and some younger teachers need time to build up the experience. So for this group of uh, participants, they feel exhausted from navigating through the structures, the school, the students, the parents. Also, they need to look hard for language-specific, targeted, age-appropriate activities. They need to work very hard to find that because it's not easy to find. On top of that, they feel they have to strike a balance between already very heavy workload and time. And some participants are still continuing their study, so they have coursework as well. So some of the comments I received from my participants were, I don't know if I'm doing it correctly, what should be included in teaching for social justice and language class, what does it, sorry, my bar, what does it look like? So teachers overall feel exhausted in this process. Last but not least, Culture stood out as a very salient and important factor that influences the teacher's agency to teach for social justice. Culture here in my study refers to cultural values, religious beliefs, and educational background. And immigration, immigrant teachers like myself, we came from a different context. Although we are different, we still carry some cultural values and worldviews and religious beliefs to US this context. When we see that social justice as an important issue to do so, it's not easy, it's not a, an easy transition for us to do so. Sometimes we, my participants feel that sometimes they were confronted, they need to confront themselves, confront their own religious belief and teaching philosophy. I wanted to use the LGBTQ issue as an example, LGBTQ topic. This topic was brought up a lot by many participants in my study. They found that on one hand, they understood the importance of accepting students' different identity, gender, identity, transgender, identity, pronouns, sexual orientation. On the other hand, it wasn't easy to do. That came from two main reasons reported by my participants. One reason was from the traditional Chinese teaching philosophy they brought to this teaching context in the US. Some participants said that Chinese is well known for teachers Chinese teachers know that the mission of teaching is to propagate the doctrine, impart professional knowledge, and resolve doubts. This is a very well-known traditional Chinese teaching philosophy. So in class, when they are not allowed to address students by boys and girls, use gender binary language, that's already difficult. I mean, it's a learning curve for them. Also, when they teach young learners, when the students approach the teacher and say, teacher, so am I a boy or girl? Can you, can you tell me, uh, am I a boy or a girl? I'm confused now. Why don't you tell me? The teacher felt that she was not allowed to tell the students, although the student could choose. The student may find out how she identify herself or he identify or them identify themselves. The teacher felt that this was a basic question observable that she could have shared with the students, but she was not able to do so. Then gradually, this teacher started to feel, am I really answering students' basic questions? Am I resolving students' doubts? Am I being a good teacher? They started to question themselves. Another group of teachers that found the LGBTQ uh, inclusivity a little bit challenging were teachers who have strong religious beliefs. When they, they feel that it's okay and totally fine to promote kindness, respect, and inclusion in classroom. But when the inclusion is extended be, to include different gender or gender fluidity, this teacher had to intentionally separate their religious beliefs and professional obligations. They saw the importance as a teacher to accept students as who they are, 
but it still requires some mental work and intellectual work for them to do so. So compared with some white American teachers who take a more direct approach to address social justice, have heated debate and critical discussion in class, I find that my participants prefer a more imperceptible influence way. They used multiple words, all these words refer to gentle touch or slow influence and to influence students. So they were all referring to this commonly oriented and conflict avoidance method to talk about social justice. You could argue that this approach was coming from the field of authority when they were elsewhere before moving to the US, but it could be also how they value or how they approach different topics. So the collectiveness and peace seeking values that they brought to this context sometimes made them feel misplaced. Like when they see the white American colleagues taking a bold and progressive approach towards that, they sometimes could feel like cultural outsider and they felt they were not doing a good job. So this self-questioning was quite uh, salient in some of my findings. And I also now want to remind you, my theoretical framework also considers teaching for social justice as an ongoing process. And I've seen that all my participants are going along this journey, going through this process, and they're driving force. They are working very hard to teach for social justice in a creative way. And the driving force for them to do so was constant historically grounded and politically engaged reflection. I see that my participants reflected on the substances of social justice. What does social justice really entail? What are the nuances, substances? And they reflected on their role in promoting equity. Are they here just to deliver knowledge, building an emotional war? Are they joining students in the force for advocacy and action? Some teachers reflected on the mission of teaching. Like I just shared with you a minute ago, they started to reflect on what's the meaning of teaching? What's the meaning of resolving doubts? What does resolving doubts look like in China? And what does resolving doubts look like in the US context? So this ongoing reflection really propelled my participants to continue on this journey. So going back to my topic, crossing the river by filling the stones. What are the stones? We know we are crossing this wide river of teaching for social justice. What are the stones? I see the stones coming from internal and external factors. The political divide within the US, lack of curriculum knowledge, lack of knowledge about social justice issues within the US, political correctness, cancel culture, religious beliefs, cultural values and backgrounds, job security, these were very obvious and strong uh, hard rocks, hard stones. It's also worth mentioning that the last piece of stone, maybe one of the last, maybe there will be more, was express expression in a different language. Some of my participants mentioned that if they really wanted to dive into critical, profound discussion about social justice, the interlocutors, students and colleagues and administrators, neighbors, they do not, many of them do not have the high enough Chinese proficiency to have this kind of profound talk. So then my participants felt like they have to use English to express their opinions. And as a second language learner of English, they sometimes felt insecure or unconfident to do so because they may misinterpret their opinions. So there was another stone in this uncertainty. So as I reflect on my own research project, this research project, I feel that teachers' understanding, tolerance, awareness, and willingness in social justice is a spectrum. As I reflect on this, an image often comes to my mind. If you are familiar with intercultural communication, you may be very familiar with the IDI, Intercultural Development Inventory, or the DMIS, Developmental Model of Intercultural sensitivity. So the spectrum, the scale in intercultural communication has the different stages, the denial, defense, minimization, acceptance, accommodation, integration. So in intercultural communication, we fall on different stages of this orientation. 
Sometimes we are totally integrated, but sometimes we fall onto denial. And I think social justice is similar. Depending on the topic, sometimes teachers are very comfortable talking about that, teaching, promoting equity. But sometimes topics are too provocative and teachers do not feel confident, comfortable or competent to do so. And this were all influenced by their internal factors. I Just this image of the stages often comes to my mind. And secondly, I have read a lot of uh, papers that also uh, that address the uh, community and curriculum influence. I've seen culture being discussed under another umbrella. So culture is being discussed under a macro level influence, talking about ideology, cultural values. But in my study, culture stood up as a really important umbrella itself because underneath the culture, there are so many nuances. And I hope to see more research on culture as a standalone umbrella to have different things to discuss, especially for immigrant world language teachers. And my findings in this study may not be new to you. You may have predicted this result, but this result really affirmed my assumptions. And they came from true and genuine feelings to see what the teachers need. The teachers have the mindset to do so, but they are lacking some specific tools. And that made what educators are doing in the field, creating language specific work that makes it even more important and valuable for long run. So as I mentioned, this work was more than scholarly work. It was a very important, instrumental, personal work for myself as a teacher, as an immigrant, as a teacher educator. So what does this, what do these findings and discussion tell us? I would say as teachers, I would encourage my teacher colleagues, world language teacher colleagues, to position language teaching and social justice within interdisciplinary discussion. Don't feel that you have to do it alone, especially when you put on one more layer of social justice. Like the examples I share with you with one of my, from one of my participants, working with other teachers can carry you further along the journey. And if you can work with history, math, geography, social studies teachers, I think you will see that your horizon is broadened and you can do more. Also, if teachers feel that social justice, this concept is still very abstract and overwhelming, I would encourage you to refer to the social justice education standards that breaks it down to identity, diversity, justice, and action. Breaking down into four columns helped me a lot as a teacher, so I know that where to start. I may start with something easier, relatively easier, identity diversity. And then when students get to more higher language proficiency, maybe I'll engage them in action. Or you do a little bit of each, a little bit of all. And don't feel you have to do all every lesson. It can be a theme through our semester or just one week or several weeks. You touch upon different columns. And I'm aware that ECFO, CALA, CIRCLE, CLTA, Chinese Language Teacher Association, many national and regional organizations are already uh, in this momentum of creating language specific proficiency appropriate age appropriate templates. And our very own CALA has funding from the government to do this line of work. And I feel that my findings really amplify the importance of this line of work. And please keep up with your good work. And also for teacher education, as a teacher educator myself, I see the importance of offering more than generic or general strategies, but also targeted language specific support. Use examples to tell teachers what they can adapt, what they can adopt. More importantly, I think it's important for teacher educators to have the cultural empathy and patience. I have seen, I have heard firsthand from some white American teacher educators who may feel discouraged and frustrated if the world Chinese or world language teachers participants are not taking a gigantic step, are not courageous enough, are not bold enough to dive into the core of social justice issues. While I see this white American colleagues wanting to help a lot, but also I wanted to remind everyone to understand immigrant teachers like myself, we come from a very different context. And on the spectrum, where are these teachers? 
and we are teaching world language to world language in a different context. And in this very context, sometimes we are the target of discrimination. Sometimes we feel hurt. It's really difficult to explain all these mental, intellectual, and emotional struggles and challenges, obstacles we have to overcome. So I will urge my colleagues and teacher educators to be more patient. And Azolas reminded us many years ago that teachers' understandings of social justice ranged along a continuum of beliefs. Last but not least, I want to join many scholars to call for further research to survey the diversity of world language teachers' perceptions, experiments, agency, and emotions in teaching for social justice in the classroom. So I want to end my presentation with a famous quote from Chinese philosopher Laozi, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It may sound cheesy, it's a cliche maybe, but it is very true. We are crossing this wide river together and it's an ongoing process and we are all filling the stones together. But if we create, share more ideas, share more research findings, it can help us see the river water clearer and we can, we can find less stones in this journey. And it's important that we walk along together and together we go further. So these next two slides have all the scholarly publications that I used quoted in this presentation. And I owe a lot of thank you to this scholarly work. And I want to thank you for coming to my presentation because your presence here means a lot because it shows you care about this topic. And of course, I welcome your feedback, suggestions, and questions. Thank you. How much time do I use? We still have uh, seven minutes for questions, Kaishan, so your timing is perfect. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's so exciting to see this new research. Um, and I love the perspective of the immigrant teachers, which I think is really left out of the conversation a lot. So I think it's great that you were able to tease out your data that way. I have a question as, as I wait for folks to write their questions in the chat. I have a question about teacher identity in relation to your findings. Um, you talked a little bit about it. You, I, I feel when you were talking about culture, you were talking a lot about teacher identity in relation to their enactment of social justice education in the classroom. I'm wondering if when you looked at the data about their understandings of social justice, um, did their identity, did their cultural background come through clearly in that as well? Or did you not look at the data that way? Maybe that's a question you can't answer at this point. You're muted, Kashan. Sorry. I feel that the understanding of social justice and identity, the connection was reflected on the topic substances of social justice. So I've heard teachers saying that coming from a Chinese background and identity as a Chinese person to begin with, and growing up in China, I think the mentality of looking at this, is, you can argue about that. I'm sure some people will argue about that. The mentality of looking at social justice was probably providing, how do I describe that? Um, so for instance, one participant mentioned that coming from a Chinese background, looking at social justice, they, they had a more optimistic, optimistic mindset to look at social justice, looking at probably they look at more of what progress we have seen than building on that. Versus her American colleague looking at social justice, she feels that this American colleague look at what needs to be done more. So if that's the way this teacher look, the American colleagues look at social justice, then the discussion will be more critical about criticizing what the government needs to be more to do more, what the community needs to be more, to do more, versus that Chinese teachers' identity is promoting peace, promoting progress. They can touch upon social justice. It's more they feel they strike a better balance to look at what's been done. Let's be hopeful, and it can be better. Yes, we can improve more, but. It's already making progress. And I think the understanding of the extent of critical confrontational discussion was a little bit different. I don't know if that answers your question. And also that leads to the different topics. Also coming from their identity, again, identity, sometimes they feel they're cultural outsider. 
coming from a different context. So the identity makes them feel more comfortable teaching about social justice issues that happen in China, but not social justice issues that happen within the US. So I think these two aspects come to my mind. Yeah, no, this does answer the question. And I think the last comment you made is such a common feeling among teachers. They don't feel like they're subject experts. And so they shouldn't be addressing these topics in class. And there's that issue of insecurity and confidence that you raised uh, during your discussion. So there's a question in the chat from Amanda um, who asks if you could speak more about how students' proficiency levels impacted the type and scope of social justice activities the teachers felt they could use in their classrooms. Thank you, it's a very good question. And like I mentioned, three very, uh, a few experienced teachers shared that they were very creative, innovative to bring in social justice topics, even at a lower level, proficiency level. But I have to say that majority of the teachers, especially those teaching young learners, they found it challenging and they found it, it's inevitable to use a little bit of English or they would use activities that students are very familiar with and embed Chinese language, just like the Band-Aid activity I mentioned. They cannot go very deep, but at least they feel they cultivate the awareness, teaching students the word Band-Aid, you need, you do not need, because the student get injured or something, and or simple phrases like that to plant the seeds. But I also want to point out uh, L.J. Randolph and Stacey Johnson had a, call, had a paper in 2016 calling for action in teaching for social justice. And in the paper, they talk about it's possible to overcome language proficiency obstacle to do so. But I think that echoes the importance of creating examples. Like the experienced teachers already share example, but because they have experience and have profound knowledge, how can we, like Kala or ACFO or Chinese Teacher Association, how can we generate a pool of examples for our teachers? I think that can lower the anxiety and nervousness of doing so. Thanks, Kaishan. Um, so there's a comment in the uh, chat from Stephen about the, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, so I apologize, about the Onigiri Project. Uh -huh. um, and Stephen uh, has a story to share. So Stephen, if you want to uh, unmute and maybe just quickly share your story of the impact of the project, uh, that would be great. Sure. So to make a long story short, I was working with this Japanese language teacher from Virginia Beach, and we were trying to shape this project to encourage Japanese business people, especially those in the United States, to participate in the Onigiri project and strengthen it by, you know, their, using their corporate representation. But at the stage of the project where she was trying to design how the students would reach out to the, these Japanese uh, you know, CEOs uh, in, in the US, there was this real struggle because culturally speaking, to communicate with such a person, you should use a very formal style. Uh, and she was just completely at a loss as to how her lower proficiency students could effectively write you know, something. So what we did was we fell back on this making thinking visible, these thinking uh, strategies that, that make thinking visible. And one of them is called color symbol image, I think it's called, where you take one concept and you try to think through it by, it by a sort of poetic angle. What color does this make you think of? What symbol and so forth? And then you talk about it. And by using color symbol image ourselves in the workshop, we were able to arrive at how the students would, what they would put in their letter. And it turned out that she wasn't going to choose that really formal style. She was going to choose what color symbol and image students came up with when they think about hunger and, and use that in, in the letter and scaffold the letter so that students would fill in part of it, but not the whole thing. And it, it, having them reflect on their own values, what is, you know, this is not exactly social justice, although it's about, you know, aid, but um, some of those visible thinking strategies, I think, are a real good match for approaching social justice. Thank you for sharing. I think those really reflect the importance of using, bringing different theories or different pedagogical decisions or methods to lead to social justice topic or this mission. And the Onigili mission, that activity, not only was it, not only was this idea or activity shared by the Chinese participant that I share, 
if you remember, I've collected 22 participants' data, including Japanese teachers. And actually, that Japanese participant also mentioned in her Japanese class how they did that. Her method was slightly different from yours, but I think it's great. Yours is reaching to outside, to community um, business to get sponsorship. Her activity was engaging students to um, make a list of shopping she embedded with a shopping topic, talking about if you want to make an onigiri, what materials do you need? But not all families have this money to buy the expensive materials. For lower income family, what are alternatives? So I think she embedded student, expanded students thinking to include different income status to do the same thing, to enjoy the same food. And I think multiple angles are there, but thank you for sharing. I, I like your example. Well, I wanna take this time to thank Kaishan and to thank all of you for coming today. We're just a couple minutes past the hour. So I apologize for infringing on your next hour of time, but it was such an interesting comment and so many great questions. And thank you, um, thank you Kaishan, uh, your research is so exciting. Can't wait to see more of it. Um, and thank you everybody for coming and for choosing Carla for your professional development today. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.